sure the thumbs up. Okay. Good evening. <laughs> we appreciate your enthusiasm. And welcome to the People's University Dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. <laughs> T-Rex is back, as you can see. T-Rex is back. Back on the tequila. T-Rex insisted on coming back. T-Rex is just part of Dinosaurs. We still have three t-shirts. They're all big sizes, but you're welcome to them. Give them to somebody. Uh, uh, help yourselves. Uh, if, so I wanted to mention that uh, September, coming up in September during Band Books Week, we're going to have a panel discussion with Rabbi Leaf, Jeff Rutherford, Darren McGinnis, and Judy Olsavsky. Uh, about Mouse, which is a graphic novel, if you know, it's basically a comic book, but it's a very uh, adult comic book. Um, if you'd like a copy, we have 50 of them. I've probably given away 15 or so, so we have less than 50. But if you get on the list here, and I have some books with me tonight, and if you come to our panel discussion, you're welcome to keep the book. But you, but you do have to have a library card to get one. Because, you know, yeah, there's, everything has a price, and the price for this is a library card. That's not too no, bad. Not it doesn't cost them anything. Uh, next Tuesday at noon, Tom Bretterhoff will be here. His book is called Foot, and it's a mystery novel, very unusual mystery novel. And next Thursday, Lindsay will be back before she goes to Canada for the last time to uh, talk about Dinosaur CSI, which is about, as you might guess, how paleontologists analyze crime scenes involving dinosaurs to look at their fossils and figure out what happened. Now, before we begin tonight, um, we're going to draw, T that is, T-Rex is going to draw the winner of another family pass to the Carnegie Museums of Pittsburgh. So it's not just the Dinosaur Museum, it's the War Hall and the Art Museum. Yes, Susan Hollis and family. Susan Hollis. You here? Well, you won. I'll, I'll give her a call tomorrow. As soon as I figure out what her phone number is. Okay. Now, that brings us to tonight's program, which, as you can see, has to do with tectonics and dinosaur dispersal. Lindsay Castro is a paleontology student and museum volunteer with a special interest in dinosaurs, believe it or not. Following her recent graduation from California University of Pennsylvania with degrees in biology and geology, she will be attending, as I mentioned, a master's degree program in biological sciences at the University of Alberta in Canada starting in this fall, where she will complete research on ornithocision. <laughs> ornithocision? Ornithocision. The cool dinosaurs, you know, the ones with all the headgear. Things like Triceratops, Stegosaurus, etc. She got her start volunteering with the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, writing Mesozoic Monthly, a series of deep dives on prehistoric creatures for the blog, a museum's blog. Here's Lindsay Castro. I want to make sure I have enough time to get through today's lecture um, before everyone has to run out 
Um, the second question, I do remember, you know, they're always looking at things like mammoth DNA. Um, anything to do with mammals, usually over my head. I'm a dinosaur girl. <laughs> um, and dinosaurs, we don't have any sort of DNA from them because they have been turned to rocks. And rocks don't have genetic material. Um, so it might be possible to get some from like a frozen mammoth, but I don't know a ton about that. But so back to people's university dinosaurs. Today we're talking about tectonics and dinosaur dispersal. Usually with these lectures, I have been talking about like just the biology of these things. Um, I'm a very biology dependent paleontologist. But today we're really going to lean into my geology degree, uh, which will be fun. And as I said last week, this is really the when and where of dinosaurs um, of my classes. Uh, the last two were the who and what, basically. Um, so this is really going to pull from a variety of topics today. So I think it's going to be really super fun. Uh, so we'll get started. So a lot of my PowerPoint today is heavily, heavily reliant on imagery from this website. This is from a website called the Paleobiology Database. Um, it's a free, open to the public website with just tons and tons of paleontology data that's been compiled um, about which species have been found, where, and when they lived. And that's awesome. And um, I love just playing around on this site, especially uh, this part called the Navigator, the PBDB Navigator. Um, and so this is what it looks like when you first open the Navigator. It shows data points of everything that they have in their database, um, all put on this very pretty map. Uh, it shows the time periods and the color and everything. Um, but you can navigate more. You can zoom in and um, see what fossils have been found in your hometown. You can tell it, oh, I want to see every hadrosaur that's ever been discovered, and it will show you that. Um, and you can even toggle like just the time period that you'd like to see. So it's a really handy tool. Um, but there's a few drawbacks to it that I want to, like, a couple caveats I want to make clear before I um, show you a bunch of pictures from this website, just so, um, you know, you know what to take it with a grain of salt. Um, sometimes the way the database or data points are coded in, they don't always have enough information to show up when you want them to, or they show up when you don't want them to, and it, it's impossible to control that. Um, so, like, I noticed for some reason that Ceratosaurus isn't listed under Ceratosauria, so when I tried to show the Ceratosauria data points, there weren't enough there. Um, and conversely, there's a lot of, like, Dromaeosaur, those raptor dinosaurs, um, where there's a bunch of data points everywhere, um, but a lot of them are just kind of, like, hard-to-tell teeth fossils. Um, so there's probably more of them that are showing up than should be the case. Uh, but regardless, very handy tool. So here is every single dinosaur that shows up on this database. Um, dinosaurs are found on all seven continents, even Antarctica. Um, even sauropods, we see them in North and South America, Europe, Asia, Africa. And like I said last week, those things are not good swimmers. So the fact that they are on multiple continents separated by huge oceans it's a very hard question to answer if we're thinking about the continents as fixed in position. Um, nowadays, we don't consider that to be true, but that's what geologists used to do. The idea of continental drift, or just the movement of the continents, is very, very new. And I did a little bit of research on what the theories were before uh, continental drift came about, and this is kind of what they look like. So one of the names that they gave to that previous theory was global cooling. Uh, it's not the opposite of global warming, despite the name. What they, they recognized that the Earth had a lot of geothermal energy. There was a lot of heat being radiated out from the core. And that was something they could easily measure. Uh, but they assumed that that heat was dissipating, that it was radiating out from the Earth and getting lost in space, so the Earth was gradually cooling. Um, and so when a lot of objects are cooled, they usually contract, they shrink. And so this gradual cooling, they thought, uh, led to the contracting of Earth's surface, uh, the crust buckled, and mountain ridges would form and valleys would form just to uh, compensate. Ooh. 
compensate for that uh, shrinking crust. Um, so you can think about it kind of like you know, a piece of fruit, like this apple on the screen. Apples start out nice and smooth, but as they shrink, uh, they get all shriveled up and you get lots of bumps and ridges, and so that's how they thought mountains would form. And it's a very um, vertical form of crustal movement, uh, not lateral like we think of today. But the, with all of that said, um, this theory didn't have a lot of ways to explain what they were seeing in the world. Um, they thought maybe volcanoes and earthquakes were caused by um, water turning to steam at really deep depths. Um, but there's a lot of weird evidence that started piling up that started changing the way that they saw things. Um, for example, they realized that radioactive decay releases heat. Um, so all those elements in the Earth's core that are decaying radioactively, they're constantly generating new heat, so our Earth is not cooling, it's replenishing that heat as it goes on. And there's other evidence that began to stack up. Um, and a lot of this went into convincing geologists that um, things were different than they previously believed. A lot of people really hold on to their, their previous theories and things like that when new evidence comes out because they really want them to be right in the first place. Um, so they, they tend to be resistant to change sometimes. Um, and, you know, you can think of like Darwin and Galileo, how, how people really push back against their ideas, but things like heliocentrism um, and evolution are, you know, mainstream ideas nowadays. But, you know, one of the big ones, one of the big pieces of evidence that started convincing people that uh, the global cooling idea was not correct was the mysterious contiguity between all of the continents. So we know that South America and Africa look like they fit together. That's been something that has been puzzling geologists and map makers and people for you know centuries. Um, but on top of that, there's a lot of other features that we can see in the world, like Eastern United States rocks are very similar to the ones in Western Europe. Um, especially in age and type. And then also we see similar fossils on each side of the Atlantic. Um, and in this picture behind me, we have this little guy, Lystrosaurus, in the top right. Um, he's an early mammal relative who uh, has these stubby little arms, definitely could not swim across an ocean, but still found in South America in, or not, not him, Lystrosaurus is found in Africa, India, Antarctica. So how did it get there if it wasn't swimming? It's very easy to think, once we think about continental drift, that the plates were closer together back then, so it was just able to stroll across. But if we don't think about the plates being able to move, it's a huge mystery. Um, but plate tectonics isn't a theory about just aimless continental drifting. It's got more direction than that. Uh, the last note on this slide was just a huge piece of evidence that helped them figure out um, what was going on and convince other geologists to subscribe to the same theory. Uh, so the paleomagnetic striping really did the heavy lifting and all that convincing. So in the middle of the ocean, like the Atlantic Ocean, there is what they call the mid-ocean mid ridge or the mid-Atlantic ridge. There is a very concise line of higher elevation through the center of the ocean, um, going like north to south, basically. And it goes along the entire Atlantic, and through that whole ridge, a new, new oceanic crust is being formed. Observing samples of crust, you can tell that um, the newest crust is right next to that ridge, and then it gets a little bit older and a little bit older as it goes on and spreads out. And it's symmetrical, so the same distance from each side is going to be the same age from each side. But that isn't all that there is to it. Uh, there's a lot of minerals in oceanic crust, and a lot of them are magnetic and orient themselves along the Earth's magnetic field as they are forming in that crust. So what was new was the fact that symmetrical across that ridge, you could see stripes where the paleomagnetic field was normal, and then it was reversed, and then it was normal, and then it was reversed. It was symmetrical across that ridge. So 
Earth's magnetic field has, has changed in the past. Uh, magnetic poles sometimes switch. This isn't to say that the poles of the Earth that we're rotating on switch and we're suddenly upside down. It's just the magnetic field. Um, I don't know the physics behind that, but sometimes north is one way, sometimes north is the other way. Um, I cannot fit that kind of physics in my brain with all these dinosaur words in there. So I won't be talking about that today. But we know that it happens because we can see it switching in those rocks by those spreading ridges. Okay. <laughs> so the seafloor spreading gave people a good idea of how continents drift. Um, and so it's definitely lateral motion. There is some vertical stuff going on, but it's definitely more lateral than the global cooling vertical shifting that they originally thought. Um, so geologists met at a bunch of conferences and did a lot of publishing between 1965 and 1967 to put forward the hypothesis or, or theory of plate tectonics. My parents were born in 1967. That is so recent. I know, like, there's people in this room who remember 1967, and just a huge, huge change in the way we think about the world happened that recent. That's crazy to me. And we're still learning new things. So who knows what they could find next year that'll turn everything on its head, right? But plate tectonics. Uh, how it works is basically this. Um, crust, the hard, hard layer at the surface of the Earth, uh, floats on top of the mantle, which is a molten layer. It's not melted, it's not liquidy, it doesn't flow like water, but it does flow in some respects. Um, so underneath the mid-ocean ridges, heat is traveling through the mantle in convection currents, and those convection currents lift the heat up in one spot under that ridge. That pushes molten rock up, forming the actual physical ridge as lava comes to the surface and cools and forms new oceanic crust. Um, and then it does it again and again, and it continuously pushes out new crust. Um, so this seafloor spreading is constantly creating new crust, and we need a way to get rid of old crust, or else things are going to start getting really funky if we're just making new crust all the time. Um, so destroying old crust is done through subduction. Uh, subduction is when one piece of crust sinks under another, um, usually at, or not usually, it's always going to be at like an oceanic trench. Um, so one piece of crust runs into the other, the other one go under it, and then it pulls the other one down, forming a very deep valley in the ocean. Um, and so the piece that's going deep into the mantle is melting, recycling all those, you know, good bits of minerals so we can make new crust. So we see things like earthquakes and volcanoes tied to all of this, you know, geologic activity. Um, and they're really heavily concentrated around um, oceanic trenches and spreading centers, uh, like the mid-ocean ridge. So looking at this map, you know, all the earthquakes are the red plus signs, the volcanoes are the um, little triangles, and they form some really, really precise lines on there. Um, so guess what? Those are our plate boundaries. Look at how closely that matches. <clears throat> Isn't that neat? So we can use all that earthquake and volcano data to show where the edges of the tectonic plates are, because that's where all the activity is. Um, and you can see the key at the bottom of this map behind me has a couple different types of plate boundaries listed. Um, so I'll explain those really quick. So there are three different ways that a plate can interact with another plate. Divergence, convergence, and transform boundaries. Divergence um, is when two plates move away from each other. Uh, when this happens, new crust is formed, the lava comes up and it cools and it makes new oceanic crust. Um, so the seafloor spreading at the mid-ocean ridge is a divergent plate boundary. Um, this process is also known as rifting, but that's usually applied to when it's like on continental crust versus oceanic. Convergence, by contrast, is when two plates move toward each other. Um, we see that in subduction zones, when one plate's going under the other. Um, the fun part is, when that plate goes under, it melts, and a lot of that still comes back up to the surface and forms volcanoes, 
on the overriding plates. So the last type of tran is a transform boundary. Uh, this is basically two plates sliding past each other. Uh, transform boundaries are important because they link the other kinds of boundaries, the convergent and divergent and stuff like that. But the crummy thing is, um, plates are not smooth. They are made of rocks and can get quite rough. Um, so sometimes when they're trying to move, they catch and they try and move and try and move and build up so much pressure that eventually they slip and release all that energy as an earthquake. So we put all of this stuff together. We can take a look at California with the famous San Andreas Fault. That's a transform boundary. It's linking all of these divergent zones up in the, uh, off the coast of Washington and Oregon and down here in Mexico. Um, so as the uh, Pacific plate is moving northwest, it is trying to move away from the uh, North American plate and they are sliding against each other approximately that way. Um, and so it's not just all this spreading and transform boundaries and stuff happening up here. It gets even more complicated when you notice there is a subduction zone where uh, the Juan de Fuca plate is sliding under the North American plate. So that creates even more of a tug on the divergent boundary. Um, but also, um, remember how I mentioned that volcanoes form on the convergent plate boundaries? As the Juan de Fuca plate is going under North America, it's making volcanoes. And up here, we have the Cascade Range, Mount St. Helens, Mount Rainier. There's a lot going on on the West Coast because of all this crazy stuff happening with the plates. So there's a couple different ways that those convergent boundaries, like that subduction zone, um, can happen, just based on what types of crust are involved. Um, continental crust is very thick, but also very light. It's not very dense, and it's made of granite. Oceanic crust, uh, by contrast, is much thinner, much denser and heavier, and it's made out of basalt. So when two plates of oceanic crust converge, uh, whichever one is slightly more dense is going to go under the other one. Um, and so it'll melt, it'll form volcanoes. Maybe those volcanoes will get so thick that they poke out of the ocean and form a little, a little volcanic island. Um, but sometimes um, uh, oceanic crust goes under continental crust. And then we get all these volcanoes on the um, continental crust, because it's, since it's lighter, it will always be on top. But two chunks of continental crust don't usually just meet like that. Um, they're pulled together when one of them is just eating another piece of oceanic crust, and it drags a piece of continental crust behind it. Um, so once it runs out of that oceanic crust to eat and runs into that continental crust, they will squish and squish and squish and keep trying to subduct, but it can't. Um, so it gets much thicker and forms a mountain range. Uh, this is a uh, called an orogeny or a mountain building event. So we know where the continents are now, and we know that they're moving, but a lot goes into figuring out where they were in the past. Um, first, we can look at cratons. We assume that cratons are stable. Craton is the thick interior piece of a continent that is usually not really affected by tectonic activity because everything's usually acting around the coasts um, and everything on the inside is relatively protected. So in this picture behind all the information on the screen, the pink and orange are pieces of craton and everything around it is constantly getting re reworked. <laughs> So that is a lot of stable crust, just looking at this map. So next we can look at sutures, which are where old plates have mushed themselves together. So usually you look for a mountain range and find evidence that both sides of the mountain range are different plates. Um, and then we can use a reference frame. So if we say that we're going to hold Africa stable, and then look at what all the plates around Africa are doing, whether they're moving away, moving toward, moving past it, um, we can get a, a good idea of where they're going just using that one reference point. 
When studying the microstructure of igneous rocks, sometimes geologists can constrain the latitude and longitude that they formed under um, just based on the orientation of those magnetic minerals inside of it and how they arrange to the magnetic field. But my favorite trick for figuring out where plates were in the past are, is called um, hot spots. Hot spots are these really weird points on the Earth's surface where the mantle is constantly just sending up super hot molten rock, and it, it is a fixed point, um, unlike the tectonic plates. So when a plate moves over that hot spot, it is leaving evidence in the form of like mountains and ridges and things um, that it passed over that hot spot. So we see this in Hawaii. Uh, I think the big island of Hawaii is the most recent, um, so it would be pretty much right over top of that hot spot. Um, and the other smaller islands used to be on top of that hot spot, but they have moved away and have started eroding. Um, so if you look under the ocean surface along Hawaii, you can actually see more old islands that have eroded down to stumps under the ocean. And it's just a huge mountain range that goes on for hundreds of miles and it's very long. And it's a very straight line just because the Pacific plate is moving northwest, and as it moves northwest, it carries those islands with it in that line, which is really, really cool. And of course, we find things like fossils and similar rocks on different continents, and that's also a pretty good indicator that they used to be close together. So let me give you a pretty local example. The Appalachian Mountains formed around 470 million years ago, uh, way before dinosaurs ever evolved. When the Iapetus Ocean, um, it's this little guy over here, when that closed because it was subducting, it pulled the land masses of Baltica and Avalonia uh, north into what was called Laurentia. Uh, that's North America today, so we are like right here. Um, so it pulls those two land masses north, boom, boom. They crash into Laurentia, and an orogeny happens. Mountains are built. Those are the Appalachians. But um, there's a lot of other subduction happening on this map. All these lines with these little triangles are subduction zones. So there's a lot of moving around happening in the Ordovician when uh, the Appalachian Mountains were formed. So once these guys crashed into here, they renamed Laurentia or Russia. And then Siberia and Kazakhstania also crashed into or Russia, making it Laurasia. There's a trend here. <laughs> and so if we keep going, we see that there's a big uh, subduction zone over here with the supercontinent Gondwana. With Gondwana coming over, it also crashes into there and it's forming more and more mountains, um, creating this huge mountain range that we can still see in places like North America with the Appalachians, we see it in Africa, in Scotland, and we call it the Central Pangean Mountains, which brings us to Pangea, the one big supercontinent. So here's North America up here. You can see Florida sticking out the middle there, um, or somewhere over here. We've got the Central Pangean Mountains stretching from North America's coast to North Africa up into Europe. And so all of this work was basically done by 335 million years ago. Uh, and it stayed in a similar state until 160 million years ago. So this is basically for not till 160 million years ago. Uh, it started or it stopped 335 and it stayed that way for 160 million years. It's a, it's a big difference, trust me. <laughs> so this is basically what the Earth looked like uh, when dinosaurs evolved in the Middle Triassic, a singular C-shaped continents um, with the Tethys Ocean nestled right in here. So one, pe one thing people don't really think about often that absolutely blows my mind is that with all the continents in one place, there's nothing to really break up the ocean into a bunch of other oceans like we see today. So we've got the Tethys, you know, that's cool and all, but everywhere else, it's just water. <laughs> Beyond Pangea, we've got this huge ocean that stretches all across the other half of the globe. Pangea basically translates into all land. 
Panthalassa means all ocean. This was a very big mass of water. Um, Pangaea isn't the only singular supercontinent that we've ever seen on Earth. Uh, we have evidence of one called Rodinia that formed around a billion years ago, and then that broke up. And 600 million years ago, we got one called Henotia, and that broke up. And we got Pangaea, and that broke up. But guess what? Continents are moving back together again. None of us will ever live to see it, because it's not estimated to be for another 250 million years. But it's pretty cool. So life on one big supercontinent wasn't very recognizable uh, to what we have now. The interior of Pangaea, all the land inside the coast, uh, was a very large area, and it was very hot, you know, hot and arid. It was very dry. There were still wet, forested areas around um, the Tethys Ocean near the poles, but they were relatively few and far between. Um, those forests consisted of gymnosperms, which are things like cycads and ginkgos and conifers, uh, not any sort of flowering plants that we know of today. Nothing that blossoms in the spring, nothing that produces fruit. They had not evolved yet and will not evolve until the Cretaceous period. The impact of all of this hot, dry land uh, was significant pressure to use those resources that no one else was able to get to. Uh, amphibians weren't able to do that because they need moist skin for gas exchange and they need wet eggs to be able to survive and produce young. So the fact that amniotes evolved, they evolved that amniotic membrane that keeps things dry and, and keeps water inside the egg so it doesn't need to be exposed to water, um, that was a huge deal. It meant that um, our, our ancestors and reptiles' ancestors were able to move away from water sources and go to those hot, dry areas and use resources that no one else was able to get to. Um, and all of this was before the dinosaurs. Uh, so it's not only significant to their evolution, but also to ours. And another impact of Pangaea on the animals that lived there um, is that with such a similar habitat across such a large landmass that is not broken up by any oceans or anything, um, there's no barriers to them just walking around and going wherever they please, really. Um, so one species can be cosmopolitan. It can be found pretty much all over the world, um, since there weren't any oceans preventing things like Lystrosaurus wandering around. So like I said before, dinosaurs popped up in the Middle Triassic, um, when we, we see the, the first of the three main time periods of the Mesozoic period. Um, we see things like Herrerasaurus and Eoraptor, those early dinosaurs I mentioned last week. Um, they show up somewhere in South America around like the Ishiguolasto formation of Argentina. Um, that has some of the oldest dinosaur fossils ever. And from there, dinosaurs spread across Pangaea, hitting places like Mexico, where we see things like Coelophysis, uh, and then heading out everywhere else. And the forests at that time were filled with gymnosperms, uh, but the dinosaurs loved it. Sauropodomorphs, all those ancestors of sauropods, uh, they ate gymnosperms, they loved gymnosperms, uh, they thought they were great. And then, um, so the dinosaurs evolved during the Triassic, and started to spread, but they weren't dominant. They were still the underdogs with those big pseudo shushian scary crocodile-looking things running around, dominating and eating everything. But they still managed to get out of that predicament. Um, so finding Triassic body fossils is tough. They're pretty rare, um, hard to come by, but footprint fossils, on the other hand, we do have a lot of. Um, one such footprint type that we see a lot of in Triassic rocks is Growlithor. So that's this guy in the top left here. It's got three toes, looks kind of bird-like. Um, they attribute it to something that looks sort of similar to Coelophysis. So these, you know, running on their hind legs, skinny, long neck, predatory dinosaurs. Um, so we don't know exactly what left these footprints behind. And I'll talk more about that next week with the dinosaur CSI talk. But there's lot more different kinds of evidence that we use than just the body fossils that we struggle to find sometimes. So here's a modern map showing all the Triassic dinosaur data points on PBDB. 
down here in Argentina is where things started. Um, it's pretty mind-blowing to see them get as far as like Australia over here or even up in China um, by the end of the Triassic. But as we have to remember, Pangea was very different. So when I found out that PVDB had a feature to show you prehistoric maps, I was elated because I was like, oh, this is going to be so great for the PowerPoint. Uh, <laughs> so check this out. This is Pangea and all the same data points from the previous slide, all these little light colored dots are here, just placed in where they would have been when the planet was arranged differently. So we've got North America over here again. We've got some stuff on the west or the east coast, some on the west coast, uh, like in New Mexico area. But Argentina is down here. So that's where it's all began. And it started spreading across to the east, across Africa. We got India, Australia. Um, it's probably we would also have fossils in Antarctica too, because there's nothing keeping them from going to Antarctica. Uh, there's no ocean in the way, no big ice packs during the Triassic. So there's probably Triassic fossils in Antarctica. They also, going from, you know, Argentina, traveled up through North America and uh, Europe, and also hopped over to China and things like that. So it doesn't stay that easy to travel for very long. Pangea obviously doesn't stay together. In the middle of the Triassic, about the same time as dinosaurs were evolving, Pangaea starts to break apart. Um, it doesn't get in the way. It's a very slow process that doesn't have any major effects on the world until like way into the Jurassic, um, but it starts. What we see is Laurasia and Guam Gondwana splitting apart again. Uh, in the middle of the Tethys Ocean, we see the seafloor spreading, starts to crank up again. Something, some sort of mantle plume uh, heats it and pushes it up and causes it to crack and form new crust. And when two pieces of crust diverge, we know multi-crust rises and takes its place. And sometimes it gets pretty absurd. <laughs> Something like the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. Um, so that whole area I showed you earlier with the uh, mountain range that went through North America, South America, Africa, and Europe. There's a big area there that had a lot of uh, volcanic activity, for lack of a better word. That entire area in red there, it was filled with flood basalts. Flood basalts are the result of seams in the crust that allow lava to just spill out onto the surface in really broad sheets, sort of like this picture here. Um, but this was happening over a large area. It wasn't like a lava Ar Armageddon. It wasn't just like lava everywhere. It was happening a lot and kind of got in the way of things. And then, um, we actually see a similar problem to that happening nowadays, just without the world ending lava, um, in East Africa, uh, in the west and east African rift valleys. So the Nubian plate and the Somalian plate in Africa are slowly diverging away from each other. Something has happened to make that crust start spreading and getting really thin. Um, so we see a valley form, we see really deep lakes forming in this area of Africa, and a bunch of volcanoes too. Uh, and so in a few million years, if this trend of this spreading keeps going, we're going to see new oceanic crust being formed in the middle of Africa, or edge of Africa. And then water's going to start filling in, and we're going to get a new seaway. And that'll be really cool, and I wish we could see it. <laughs> but, whatever. I mentioned last week that one of the most important things to happen in dinosaur evolution was that all of their competitors went extinct at the end of the Triassic. Um, so, the big... Darn it, what was it called? The Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. They call it the camp, but that's kind of confusing if you haven't heard that acronym before. Um, so when that was going on and all those flood basalts were letting out lava, they weren't just letting out lava. More importantly, they released tons and tons of gases, uh, things like CO2 and the like. Uh, and that caused climate change and ocean acidification very similar problems to today with what we're dealing with. Um, 
So with the climate change, it stressed a lot of terrestrial uh, habitats. So a lot of the land animals went extinct, like a lot of amphibians and mammal relatives and all of those archosaurs except for dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and crocodiliforms, clearing the way for dinosaurs to really explode. But also, um, with that ocean acidification, all of that carbon dioxide that's building up in the atmosphere, some of it diffuses into the ocean water. Um, when that happens, it makes the ocean water more acidic. And acidic ocean water prevents shelled organisms from making calcium carbonate shells. So almost a quarter of every marine species was wiped off the planet because they weren't able to make their shells anymore. Um, and also another group was just completely wiped off the planet. You've never heard of conodonts because they stopped existing at the end of the Triassic. There are these weird uh, eel-like creatures with crazy looking teeth, but they were kind of weird, kind of small, kind of cute. Um, but we'll never see one of those again because <laughs> they're gone. But moving across the Triassic-Jurassic boundary, uh, passing that temporal boundary and surviving that uh, extinction event, we hit the Jurassic, obviously. Things are still mostly connected together. Um, so dinosaurs are still fairly homogenous during the early Jurassic. But we do see things starting to break up. So with all of that spreading that's happening in the Tethys, North America and Africa start pulling apart. And we see the Central Atlantic Ocean starting to fill in there. But otherwise, you know, with this little bit, little gap here, things are still pretty easy to navigate through this Pangaea continent. By the end of the Jurassic, that changes. North and South America fully pull apart, so we have an entire Central Atlantic Ocean starting to form here. Um, we also see things like India pulling away from Africa, forming the beginning of the Indian Ocean. Um, and with that, we get more flood basalts, but they aren't nearly as bad and as big of a problem. But there's a lot of other cool things happening too. So in addition to all that activity splitting up the Americas and yeeting India off to the side there, uh, we see Europe get inundated with water. Uh, so it becomes an archipelago surrounded by a really nice, shallow, warm sea. And so that Pacific Plate also didn't exist during the Triassic, the Pacific Plate that's giving us so much trouble out in California right now. It starts showing up in the Jurassic. It just starts just some little dot in the middle of Panthalassa, that giant ocean, starts spreading out and pushing all of that continental crust around it underneath, or not continental crust, oceanic crust under the continents. So that's forming the new Pacific Plate at that time. And so the climate during the Jurassic is also warmer than it is now uh, by about 5 to 10 degrees Celsius, or I think that's like 9 to 18 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so still very much warmer than it is now. We're worried about one degree changing the globe very significantly right now. This would be really crazy. Uh, so the poles aren't frozen in the Jurassic. There's no ice caps, uh, but there's still snow. Snow falls in high elevation and in areas with a lot of seasonality. Um, and you know, there's a lot of forests around the poles still. There's deserts, there's scrublands, uh, lots of variation in habitat now. So one big supercontinent like Pangaea with a lot of contiguous, like same habitat throughout it means that you have one big population of animals that can interbreed with each other. When there's something in the way, like an ocean, say, or a big mountain range or a canyon, that imposes a barrier that keeps two halves of a population from interacting and interbreeding. So two or more populations in a, of a single species that suddenly can't breed, you're not going to have any gene flow possible. Uh, so if you have two populations separated, and this one over here has a genetic mutation that starts spreading through the population and results in you know, maybe a new species forming, those new genes aren't able to spread to this population that it used to communicate with. So we call that allopatric speciation, when there's a physical barrier preventing two populations from interacting and they mutate so much they become different species. Uh, so even if that barrier in the middle went away, if there was a land bridge connecting those two continents all of a sudden, they wouldn't be able to interbreed again because they diverge so much that they become incompatible. 
So we see a lot of evidence for that around the world today. Um, things like there's different squirrel species on each side of the Grand Canyon that can't reasonably cross the Grand Canyon to mate. Um, we even have like Darwin's finches, the classic example. Um, they move out from Ecuador. One of, one of these little tiny birds got blown from Ecuador out to the Galapagos Islands. Um, and we got a radiation where they were able to adapt to different uh, food sources on different islands and can't reasonably cross the ocean between the islands to mate. So we get a bunch of different species on different islands. Oops, more what I was talking about there too. So there's a really fun example of other things that happen on islands too when it comes to geographic barriers. For whatever reason, Islands tend to make things either very big or very small. It's called like insular gigantism or insular dwarfism. Uh, and so in prehistoric Malta and Sicily, like maybe 700,000 years ago, so not super old compared to dinosaurs, we got things like the giant swan, Cygnus falconeri, uh, bullying the crap out of pygmy elephants that were smaller than it. A lot of really weird things happen on islands. Including, we see this in dinosaurs too. Um, the island dwelling dinosaur Megiarosaurus is a member of the family Titanosauria, the family of sauropods that were the largest things that ever existed. Also, the smallest sauropod that ever existed was in that group too, because it was found on an island. So, here's where we see all of those Jurassic dinosaurs on the PBDB navigator. We got a good spread across all seven continents here. Um, now that there's barriers in the way, though, we start seeing things get a, more, a bit more complicated. Uh, so I'm breaking this down into different groups of animals just so we can track where they're going. So for the next few slides, I'll have the data points on the modern map at the top. I apologize that it's so hard to see. Uh, and on the prehistoric map, uh, the Jurassic map at the bottom. So during the early Jurassic, the large theropod groups consisted of the Ceratosauria, the Megalosauridae, and the Megalosauroidea, er, uh, which we mentioned last week, uh, but for refreshers like the Ceratosauria includes Ceratosaurus, um, we got Megalosauridae like Torvosaurus, and Allosauroidea has things like Allosaurus. Usually, they're pretty straightforward names. Um, and so the oldest ceratosaurs start somewhere in Europe. Like we, one of the oldest examples we have of them is from Italy. Uh, and then they spread to all of the continents, but went extinct in the northern hemisphere at the end of the Jurassic. Uh, we only found them in the southern hemisphere in Gondwana after the end of the Jurassic. Um, Megalosaurids, um, the Torvosaurus side of the Megalosauroid family, they also start somewhere in Europe, start spreading across the world from this point, going over to like China and down into Gondwana. Um, but as a, as a whole, those Megalosaurids go extinct at the end of the Jurassic as well. Um, and then the Allosaurids evolve either in Asia or South America. Uh, we have really old fossils from both places, which make it kind of confusing to know where they started out. Um, and then they spread everywhere and got eradicated in the Northern Hemisphere again by the Jurassic period when they were uh, replaced by the Tyrannosaurus. So this map only shows the Manoraptorans, which are things like raptors and birds. Um, and so there's a couple points over in North America, there's a couple over in Asia, one or two around Europe and Africa. Um, but, you know, the Tyrannosaurids and all the other members of their group follow this same pattern. The Tyrannosauroids start somewhere in Eurasia, but spread across um, into North America, and they really dominate up here in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, the Trudontids, um, things similar to a Velociraptor with slightly different claws, they show up in North America and spread across Eurasia, so just the opposite of the Tyrannosaurids. And then the aviale, the group that includes birds, they pop up in China during the early Jurassic, I believe. And then the most famous example is from Germany, 
Archaeopteryx, and that's in the late Jurassic. So they did move across the continent slowly during that time period. So sauropods originated in Africa. Uh, they really got around during the Jurassic. So the first ones would have been things like Volcanodon in Africa, and then the Memenchisaurids, that group that was the first ones to get huge, they pretty much stuck to China. They went up here, went to Asia, and stayed there. The Diplodocoids, things like Diplodocus and Brontosaurus, they spread farther. They went to North America, Europe, Africa, South America. So everything that's mostly connected here, except for Asia, where the Memenchisaurids are. And then the Macronarians, like Brachiosaurus, they also follow that same pattern. Ornithischians, my favorite group, um, they also start spreading out during this time period. Uh, the Thyroforans, which are my favorites, um, they're kind of divided. The Stegosaurs first appear in Asia and spread worldwide, but they only really dominate during the Jurassic. They're, they pretty much fizzle out by the end. There's a couple ankylosaurs that show up in the Jurassic up in the north as well, um, but they don't get big until the Cretaceous, the next period. Ceratopsians, we see some very early ones poking up in Asia, but they don't really spread out at, uh, yet. And then Ankyplexia, the one that includes Iguanodon and all the duck-billed hadrosaurs, um, they start somewhere in North America probably, and then spread east across Eurasia. So that brings us to the Cretaceous period, uh, the best time period because it includes the ankylosaurs. Uh, so this is, this is what things look like near the end of the Cretaceous, where we took all of those patterns that were happening earlier and just made them worse. So Gondwana is pretty much broken up by now. Um, you know, we see South America and Africa completely splitting apart. India is off on its own. Antarctica and Australia are moving towards their current places. Um, and check out what India is doing. There's this subduction zone up north that is dragging India, whoops, dragging India north. Eventually, India crashes into Asia, just like we know where it is today, and with those two continents crashing into each other and smooshing each other, we get the Himalayas. So that's where this comes from, which is really, really cool. So I also want to point your attention towards North America. North America did not get pulled apart into different continents. It is still one big continent, but the sea level was so high during the Cretaceous that it ended up flooding parts of North America and creating this huge seaway down the middle. We call that the Western Interior Seaway. We actually have a lot of fossil evidence of this, because uh, if you go out towards like Kansas and stuff in the Midwest, you're going to see lots of marine fossils like Mosasaurus, just, you know, instead of dinosaurs on the surface there, which is really, really neat. So this map isn't much later. It's only like 30 million years later. Um, and it's at the very end of the Cretaceous, the boundary where we don't see any more non-avian dinosaurs afterward. Um, so I just wanted to pull your attention over here to this little impact crater near Mexico where a 10 mile wide asteroid struck the Earth and probably killed all of our favorite animals. <laughs> but with all the continents finally separating, Gondwana is basically Gondwana. <laughs> Very proud of that one. <laughs> all this rifting is happening and warm temperatures are melting ice and the sea level rises, uh, forming the Western Interior Seaway, which is what we call an Epiric Sea. It's one that goes onto a continent for a short amount of time. Um, and those warm temperatures mean no polar ice caps still. Um, forests still extend down to the poles. We have forests in Antarctica uh, and dinosaurs are there. It's still kind of sl snowy sometimes when it gets cold or during winter, but the dinosaurs don't mind. They're still hanging out. We've got lots of examples of polar dinosaurs, which is really cool. Um, and then in the tropics, they get even more wet and rainy. Uh, but we still have things like deserts and scrublands. And as I mentioned earlier, the flowering plants evolved during the Cretaceous, which is really, really cool because grass is a flowering plant. Grass did not exist throughout the Triassic and the Jurassic. 
Dinosaurs were not eating grass through those times. Grass only showed up during like the late Cretaceous with the other flowering plants uh, producing fruit and things like that. So if you see someone painting like a stegosaurus eating grass, it's a temporal anomaly, you can call it. <laughs> so with all these continents being broken apart and all these different habitats around, um, we see some pretty intense differentiation uh, happening with the dinosaurs. So the last few slides that I have, uh, the last time that I have, we're just going to dive into more of these paleobio database maps um, of the Cretaceous and see what the animals back then were doing. So first we have our giant predators. Uh, the surviving megalosaur is, or megalosauroids, nanosauroids, um, the spinosaurids and the carcharodontosauridae, um, they take over the southern hemisphere basically. They're very big in South America and Africa, um, but like I said, everything that was around during the Jurassic pretty much goes away in Laurasia to make way for the tyrannosaurids. Um, and abelosaurids too, they are the surviving ceratosaurians, and you know we still see some of these groups up in Europe, but mostly they're all constricted to the, the southern hemisphere, the old Gondwana continents. The tyrannosaurids, you know, really explode onto the scene and become the dominant large predators uh, in the northern ecosystems. We see them in western North America, and um, oh, I forgot to mention there's a land bridge. <laughs> The um, Western Interior Seaway kind of separates North America. So Eastern US is pretty much completely like separated from the Western uh, North American continent. And there's still some mobility able to go on because there's a land bridge around Alaska connecting it to Asia. So Eurasia and Western United States, Western America are, there's still mobility between there. Eastern North America, pretty much cut off. So, the Tyrannosaurids, we see them kind of around North America, heavily populated in the West, and they are able to spread to Eurasia as well um, because of that land bridge. So when we talk about smaller theropods, the small things like Velociraptor and the Trudontids and the Oviraptors, um, we really see them flourish in Laurasia too. Uh, some of them hitched a ride on Gondwana before it got away. We see some of these data points down here. Um, but mostly, we see them on Western US and through Europe and Asia, just like the Tyrannosaurids. The herbivorous, herbivorous and omnivorous weird theropods also show up uh, during the Cretaceous. We see the Therizinosaurids, which are those big goose-looking things with the giant three-foot claws. Um, and the Ornithomimids showing up during this time period. Uh, the Therizinosaurs are pretty much, like, they're very few and far between, and we only really see them on both, the, oh my goodness, on both sides of that, that land bridge. The Ornithomimids are able to spread out a little more. We see them in Africa. Uh, heavily in Europe as well, and even in the eastern United States. Sauropods, uh, the brachiosaurids are mostly gone by this point, but diplodocoids are still around. Um, the rabachisaurids spread to Europe, North Africa, South America, um, so we still have lots of the diplodocoids, the diplodocus relatives, roaming around. Um, but the really big sauropods, not just in size, but in numbers during the Cretaceous were the titanosaurs. Um, they spread worldwide, they were on all seven continents, uh, but they were really heavily populated in South America, where we see some of the biggest ones, like Argentinosaurus and Patagotitan, um, which usually end up competing for that top spot of longest dinosaur. So, my beloved ankylosaurs are very interesting. Um, the most basal or, or primitive versions, for whatever reason, are found in the Gondwana continents, the South America, Antarctica, Australia. And so somehow the more derived ones ended up in Laurasia up north. So uh, the notosaurids, the ones that don't have the big tail clubs, they 
start out somewhere in Eurasia and spread all across. So we see them in North America, we see them in Europe, we see them in Asia. The ankylosaurids, with the big tail clubs on their tails, um, probably originate in Asia, and we see a bunch of them on this map here. Uh, and they probably replace all those notosaurids, and that's why we don't have as many data points on the right over there. <coughs> Marginocephalia, the really weird group that combines ceratopsians and the pachycephalosaurs with their dome heads, um, also starts spreading out during this time. We saw the early ceratopsians start in Asia, um, and then they don't really get a wide range until they get to their crazy big cow forms. Uh, the pachycephalosaurs uh, do spread through Asia and Western North America. So interestingly enough, those big crazy ceratopsians with the frills on their necks and all the horns, the two different groups have very similar ranges. Um, the centrosaurians with the really big nose horns have a little bit more northern reach in Western North America. The caspasaurians, like Triceratops with the big brow horns, are a little bit more limited, but they're still here in Western North America. And ending it on the hadrosaurs, just like last week, um, we see them in North America and Eurasia. The lambisaurines are a little bit more populous, or we find a lot more of them, and they have a little bit larger range than their sorolophine relatives. The sorolophines didn't have the nasally crests that can make noises. The lambiosaurians did. So, with that all out of the way, <laughs> that brings us to the end of the Mesozoic, the end of the where and when of dinosaur history. Uh, next week, if you come back same time, same place, I'll tell you the how. How we figure out what dinosaurs looked like, what they did, what they ate. Um, it's sort of like crime scene investigation, hence the name Dinosaur CSI. <laughs> Thank you for listening to that talk today. <laughs> now I'm happy to take more questions now that that's over with. <laughs> Um, so, ironically, eastern U.S. is buried, or, I don't want to say buried, but our half of the, like, United States is either covered in rocks that are too old or too young to show dinosaurs. Um, so I know in this area I found a lot of plant fossils that showed up before dinosaurs did. All of the, like, newer stuff that would have held dinosaurs has eroded away. Um, and then similarly, sometimes it's covered up by stuff including um, like Ice Age animals, woolly mammoths. It's all on top of the dinosaurs, you can't get to them. So we don't have a lot of evidence of what dinosaurs would have been on this side of the continent. We know that they would have been here because there's no reason for them not to be. But we don't have a lot of evidence to go on on what was around here, which is sad, but still a lot of cool stuff to be found here. Yes? So I have a question to go to your geology. Back when, two-thirds of the Earth is water, uh -huh. one-third is, is land. Different density involved there. Why didn't the Earth really wobble? Yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know a ton about that, uh, especially with the physics and all involved. I really don't like physics. <laughs> but um, I assume that might have been one of the reasons why it started drifting. Um, but really, just the way it spins, there's a lot of centrifugal force and stuff holding things together. Um, so I wouldn't assume it would be that much of a problem. But for big, massive supercontinents to form and break up so many times, there has to be some sort of thing that's stopping them from persisting. Maybe that's it. Any other questions? Oh, I see one from online. Um, kind of, yeah. Uh, so they asked if all of the like 
primary mountain ranges that we see along the edges of the North America are the edges of the Craton or the Craton. Um, e, kind of, yes. Yeah. The Craton is the stable area in the middle that we don't see a lot happening to. Um, and then we see a lot of stuff happening on the edges there. So without having a more informed answer, I would say yes, but it might be something that we have to look further into. <laughs> Anyone else? No more for online? All right. <laughs> I guess we did pretty good on time this time. Sorry about last week, but thank you all for coming. Thank you. No problem.